Shalom. Welcome to the Shepherd's Light Online Church. Before the service starts, we wanted to invite you to join our chat. The chat is where you can ask questions, share verses, and connect with other viewers from around the world. Just write your first comment and choose the nickname to join. If you need prayer, click the live prayer icon and you'll be taken to a private chat where one of our team members will pray with you. The service is about to start. Don't forget to sign up so you can keep your username and profile. God bless you and enjoy the message.
Well, God bless you and welcome home. Bivrit in Hebrew, Baruch haba habayta, Bruchim habayim habayta. So good to be back again with you today, and thanks so much for coming again this week. We realize it's not always possible to travel to a service somewhere and to fellowship with the other people there. So as you know, we bring that service to you, wherever you are, anywhere in Israel, anywhere in the world for that matter. And we hope you'll be encouraged today as you discover God's peace, His promises for your life. Now, would you open in your Bibles to the New Testament? Remember, Bivrit in Hebrew, New Testament is pronounced Habrit HaChadasha. That's where we're going to be today, Habrit HaChadasha. And we're going to be in the book of Acts. Do you remember that one? Bivrit in Hebrew, Masei HaShlechim, Masei HaShlechim, the book of Acts, the doings of the sent ones. That's how you would interpret that in Hebrew. And we're going to be in chapter 19 today, Perak Chaisre, chapter 19. From verse 1 through verse 20, that's where we're going to be. And as you know, we also put those verses up here for you in the video, just right up here, just to make it easier for you to follow along. And I'd like to talk to you today about continuing. You know, many people today are easily distracted. You notice it, I'm sure. You're waiting behind someone at a red light, and the person up there at the front is... is texting on their phone, and everyone behind them is waiting to get through the light that has just turned green, and everyone else is taken off, but that person in front of you is distracted by their phone. And I've heard of accidents that happen because people look down at their phone or, or they're turning their radio or something. They take their eyes off the road. Sometimes we take our eyes off the important road, too but in a different way. We'll talk about that today. You know, it's difficult to stay focused on one thing for any length of time, isn't it? And there's always so many other things in life that are competing for our time, trying to lure our attention away from what we're doing, trying to get you to look somewhere else or to think about something else. But these constant detractions are robbing you of the great things that God has for you in His calling that He wants to give you. These constant distractions are controlling who you are and what you do. You may not even realize it until you just kind of like tie it together and you, you see other people doing the same thing. You go, what are they thinking? And the reality is they're not thinking. They're just being entertained by their phone or looking at something else or they're talking to someone or, or texting or, or watching a video or something. And now when they shouldn't really be doing that at that particular point in time, should be doing the important things. And when you're in a car, that would be driving. You have to change your heart to settle for other things in life, for bigger things. These constant distractions are trying to rob you of what God has for you, which is a, a dream calling that He has for you and that He's trained you for, He's equipped you for it. And these other things, though, are trying to change your heart to settle for a mere existence just to go through life breathing and walking and looking around and you're not accomplishing anything. All you're doing is spending your time just being distracted by these things. They're changing your heart to settle for a mere existence instead of living the powerful life, the calling that God has for you to live. These constant distractions are limiting how much thought, how much time you really can give just any one thing, even an important thing. They're always trying to get you to look over here. Oh, a shiny object over here. Look over there. Oh, this is funny. Look over here. LOL, look at this. This video, look at this. Hey, check this out. All of these people trying to tug at you and keep you away from the really important things that you're doing. I realize they may not realize that they're doing that. They may not realize that they're trying to keep you away from important things, but in reality, just like you, they've come to believe that there are really no important things and they're just supposed to go through life being entertained by the little screens on their phones. They're limiting how much you think and how much time you can give the really important things. The important things in life are compromised and you give away your peace of mind when you're always searching for more things to entertain your eyes. If you're always going from one thing to another, you really aren't going anywhere. I'll say that again. 
If you're always going from one thing to another, over here, over there, you're not really going anywhere at all in life. You aren't going to be doing anything very well or truly big or important in life. You're just spending your time chasing shadows when you should be chasing dreams that God has put in your heart. But the people who make truly big contributions in life are the ones who stay focused on something big. They take the time to learn about their calling. They take the time to learn about their ministry. They think about how important it is, and they give it a priority over other things of lesser importance. If you're someone who's getting bored with big tasks that take a little while to do, you're constantly letting your attention run to the next thing that catches your eye, you're probably not making any big impact in life. You're not going through life doing big things. You're just going through life being entertained. You're always taking, but you're rarely giving. But Jesus said, freely you've received, freely give. He's given His life for us. He's given hope for us. He's given the love of God to us. You should be giving the same things that you've freely received, and you should be freely giving those out to others. That should be the purpose of your life right now. But if you patiently persist, you see, in the calling that God has given you, if you don't give up every time something doesn't go like you think it should, every time something goes wrong, you give up, don't do that. If you keep your head up and your eyes looking ahead and on the Lord, then He's going to do amazing things in your life. You just keep running that race all the way to the finish line then you'll make an amazing impact on the lives of others, the ones around you. Stop aiming so low in life. Set your sights on the high and noble work that God is calling you to do. Persist. Don't give up. No matter what, you keep showing up in life. Because when you do, one day, others are going to look back at your life and be grateful for what God did through you. And you'll be at peace with yourself, and you'll be glad that you didn't give up. Don't give up at the first sign of trouble. You just keep showing up. That's called persist. Persist. Just keep showing up no matter what you think happens. The first sign of trouble, if you turn and run, you're not serious about your calling. You just stick with it. You'll see how God is going to pull you out of that trial, pull you through. He's going to pull you into the light on the other side of that darkness. And He's going to look back, and you're going to see the things that He's done in your life, and you'll be so glad that you didn't give up. You stay with it. You run that race, make it all the way to the finish line. That's what our chapter today is talking about in Acts chapter 19. We're only going to go through the first 20 verses. Let's read it together now. And as you know, we'll stop every once in a while as we go through it to talk about what it all means. And Acts chapter 19, verse 1 today, it says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the regions, came to Ephesus. You may remember from our chapter last week, Apollos was a guy who knew about the baptism of John, but he didn't know really too much about Jesus. And of course, John was telling the people about Jesus. But he knew that John was having a baptism of repentance. He didn't really know much more than that. But he was a man of God, trying to be a man of God in what he knew of the Scriptures, but no one had told him about Jesus, and no one had told him that God would send His Holy Spirit because of Jesus being raised from the dead, and that the Holy Spirit would be with him and empower him to speak about the gospel and the cross. No one had told Apollos that. But then Paul met him. You may remember that there was this couple, Priscilla and Aquila, who were also tent makers like Paul was. He had a job on the side, so he wouldn't be a burden to the church. He made his money by selling and repairing tents and making tents to order for other people. And so he wouldn't have to try to gain money for telling the gospel, which God wanted him to do it for free. And so Paul could have asked. He could have asked for money at that time. And it's certainly in the Bible. The priests were able to do that according to the law in the Torah, the law of, the, of, the, of, of Moses there in the first part of the Bible, the first five books. He could have asked for money just like the other people, but he didn't. Paul 
wanted to freely give to the people. And so he said, I'm not going to because I've got a job I can work at. So I choose to work at that job. So no one will think I'm just saying this to make myself rich. And so Paul did this for free. And if you can do that, that's the way to do it. I've heard stories about some pastors and everything in different parts of the world where they've convinced the people that they're so special, these pastors are, that the people should buy them a big, nice new BMW and all of these other things because they're serving God and they want the people to buy all these things. But why don't you try to do it like Jesus did? Become a servant. He only had the clothes on his back. He did that. And look at how his life changed the world more than any other person who's ever lived. Split time itself into two parts. The most important man who ever lived in all of civilization changed civilization on earth forever and ever. And here he was, a servant, giving his life for all. He wasn't trying to make himself rich. He was trying to make you and I rich in the spirit. And so that's what Paul is doing now. And so he had met, after Priscilla and Aquila met Apollos, and they were traveling around with Paul, after they met Apollos, they saw that he was only teaching about the baptism of John that led to repentance. But that he didn't know about the cross. He didn't know about the resurrection of Jesus. He certainly didn't know about the Holy Spirit. So they took him aside and talked to him. And he, his eyes were open, and he started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in power, doing mighty things, refuting these people with false doctrines and bad theology. And wow, he was a powerful, eloquent speaker of the Word of God. And now Paul finds out that Apollos is at Corinth, so he thinks, well, you know what? Corinth is now in good hands. I stayed there for a while. Now, Apollos is there. He'll teach them the Word of God. I know he teaches the Word of God. So I'm going to move on down up to Ephesus. And Paul went to Ephesus, we see in verse 1. It says then, as he goes forward now into verse 2, and finding some disciples there at Ephesus, Paul said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, We haven't even so much as heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Well, into what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said in verse 4, Well, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That's Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke with tongues. They prophesied. And now the men were, the ones there, were about 12 men in all. Now, remember last week we talked about how baptism is not a Christian thing. Oh, it is today, but not in the beginning. It was a Jewish thing. What, you say? What? You're saying it was something from my people, the Jewish people? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Well, we don't have anything called baptism. No, you didn't call it that. In the early days, you called it a mikvah. And now some of you Jewish people are going, oh, I know a mikvah. It's at the Beit Knesset, the synagogue. It's where the, the women go for impurities and things like that. No, that's not how it started. Back in the antiquities, in fact, if you look at all the excavations of towns and cities throughout Israel, you will find that the very first thing that they did when the Jewish people came to an area and started a little town or a little village was they made a mikvah. And they dug dirt out of the ground, a big place for dirt, and, and they filled it up with water, and they put walls around it, and they put two sets of steps going down into it. One step, the step on the right, you would go down into the water, step down in that step into the water, and then you would come back up, not the same way you came down there, but you would come back up the steps on the left. Those were the steps. And the reason is, is because the mikvah was a Jewish custom and a tradition where people would rededicate themselves to the Lord. And here's why the two steps. They want to dedicate themselves to the Lord by going down into the water, letting the water pass over them, over the top, and cleansing them of their sins. And then they would come back up, not on the steps that they used to go down there, but they would come up the other steps because they're now clean and you shouldn't be walking back where you were sinning before if now you're clean. You see what I'm saying, right? It's a Jewish thing. 
It's a Jewish thing. Check it out. Tiftok. <laughs> Look it up. You'll find it out, okay? And what was that being covered over with water? No, it wasn't called a bag baptism. It was called a mikvah, and people considered that dedication of their life to the Lord to be so important that it was the very first thing that was built when they made a new town there, when they made a new village there, a new place there, a settlement there, they would make a mikvah. And so that's why in all of these diggings that you find from the antique uh, antiquities, you'll find the ruins of many mikvahot, which is plural for mikvah. It's a place where people went to dedicate themselves to the Lord, showing themselves to be what? kind of their old man to be buried, those sins to be buried and washed away in the water, and then coming back up a different way, a different man, a different person, the mikvah. And so now we see that Paul tells these people about Jesus. He tells them about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they are speaking in tongues. They are prophesying words from the Holy Spirit that only the Holy Spirit can give them. They were baptized baptized, and Paul baptized them there. He explained that John had a baptism of repentance, but the real baptism was from Jesus, and John the Baptist talked about it. He said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, and he's pointing to Jesus when Jesus came and was baptized. And even though Jesus didn't have any sins, he did it as an example so that you and I and all believers after him would follow. Are you saved in being baptized? No. You're saved in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in the book of Joel, in the Tanakh as well, it says, And it will come to pass in the last days that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't say anything about baptism. Jesus, when he was crucified, was there on the cross, and two other people, thieves, were crucified right beside him. And one of them said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus told that person, I mean that person right then, right there, as they're both hanging on the crosses, their crosses, that one thief believed in Jesus. He didn't come down from that cross and get baptized, and yet look at what Jesus told him. He said, I tell you, this day you will be with me in paradise. He wasn't baptized, but yet he was saved. Yes, baptism is a witness to those around you who see that you're making a public confession of your faith and that you're not afraid, you're not ashamed to say that you're a believer in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. So baptism is a good thing, you see. And Paul had the liberty now to tell these people, and when they believed there was water, so he baptized them. Kacha. That's the way it is. Now we're going down now to verse 8. And it says in verse 8, as we continue through our verses today, it says, And Paul went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months. You know that that's what Paul did whenever he came into a new town, a new city. He would go into the synagogue because he wanted to speak to his Jewish brothers about the Jewish Messiah. And Jesus was certainly the one who fulfilled those prophecies. And once he told people, many of the Jewish people believed. Some didn't. And there were some problems because of the ones who didn't believe. But many did believe, and they're very, very happy for it. And believe me, I, I've seen rabbis that now believe in Yeshua as the Messiah. I've seen many, many Jewish people. I'm Jewish, came from a Jewish family. I now believe. And you know what? We're all very, very happy. We have that peace you're looking for. Listen, this is the peace that you're looking for. Believe on the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, and your sins will be forgiven, and you will have a peace that comes upon you that passes all understanding, a peace that the world can never take away no matter what happens, no matter what they do, no matter how they persecute you, and God will be with you every day because He'll send His Holy Spirit, yes, the one spoken of in the Tanakh, the one spoken of in the Torah when it says in the uh, Sefer Bereshit, the book of Genesis, by Perek Stein, that the Holy Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep, over the face of the waters. And the Holy Spirit is spoken of many times throughout the Bible. It speaks of God, it speaks of the Lord, it speaks of the Holy Spirit. These are not three gods. They're all one God. 
but God exists in ways that are beyond your imagination to comprehend. He's not like you and I. He created us in His image in that we have eternal spirit, and He is eternal spirit. But it doesn't mean that He has two arms, two legs. It doesn't mean that He has two nostrils, two ears. And, and what color is His hair? Or maybe because He's really old, you think, well, maybe He doesn't have any hair anymore. Certainly His hair is white. Come on. You can't comprehend God. You can't even comprehend the angels that are before His throne, those creatures that have four faces, one facing this way, one this way, one this way, and one that. Six wings, two they cover their eyes, two they cover their feet, and two they fly with. If you think you understand God, you tell me. If you're so smart, you tell me how many minds do those creatures have with four faces? If you don't understand the creatures before the throne of God, how can you stand there and tell me you understand God and how He exists? Can He be three in one? Absolutely He can. Yifshar, Yifshar le Elohim. Nothing is impossible with God. It's all possible with God. And so we see now Paul is going into the synagogue trying to persuade his Jewish brothers because he loves them just like I love my Jewish brothers and sisters. I have wonderful Jewish brothers and sisters. Oh, I say, oh, so many. I, I just don't want to name the names of them because there's so many and I might miss somebody, but so many brothers that I have. Nisim, I miss you, my brother. I can't wait to see you again. Oh, so many people, so many people. I love so much and can't wait to see them again. But Paul went in there to the synagogue and spoke boldly. For three months and when you speak about the Lord you're a child of God don't speak apologetically don't be shy about it don't you dare be angry about it don't be smarter than everybody else you just speak humbly but you speak boldly just like the prophets in the Tanakh did because the same Spirit of God who gave them the words to say will now dwell in his believers today and so you speak boldly as he gives you that boldness. But it says now in verse 9, after Paul was speaking there for nine months, uh, sorry, three months, it says, but then some were hardened, and they, didn't not, and they did not believe. But instead they spoke evil of the way. Remember, that's what they called Christians in the early days, the way, because Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so they said, well, we are of the way because we believe in the one who is the way, Yeshua HaMashiach. And so the people were calling this the way. They weren't called Christians, I mean, a few times there in the early days, but they were saying that these believers in Yeshua were called, uh, that they believed in the way. And so it says in verse 9, it says, Some of those hardened of heart did not believe, but they spoke evil of the way before the multitudes. That's the Greeks and the Gentiles as well. And then when Paul saw this, it says he departed from them, the synagogue, and the believers. He didn't want to offend the rest of the believers and cause them trouble. So he departed from those unbelievers, and he took the disciples who had believed. And yes, we're talking about Jewish believers there too, you see. And he said, and he was reasoning with them daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now, we're not talking about Tyrannosaurus Rex, okay? We don't know if his middle name was Rex, but Tyrannus was a, a pretty mean teacher. But anyway, Paul got to use his place where he would teach, and he wasn't under the teaching of Tyrannus, but Paul was teaching the people, the new believers, about the kingdom of God. And there's a lesson for you and I there. When people keep fighting against you and fighting against you about the gospel and you've already proclaimed the gospel, don't try to keep on persuading, 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 trying to think, well, what kind of words of wisdom can I say? You know, it's not a thing about wisdom. It's a thing about you planting the seed there and seeing if it grows. And God will cause the growth. And some people are not going to come to Him because God made us with freedom of decision and choice. We're not robots that He presses buttons and writes software, tells us what to do every day, every second of every day, every year of our lives. We're not robots. God created us in His image. We have the ability to decide. We have the ability to make a choice. 
Now, I know some of the five-point Calvinists will say, well, like, no, man is, doesn't have anything to do with it. God gets all the choice, and, and it's only His choice that matters. Man doesn't have any choice in the matter. Well, tell me something. You're, you're so concerned about protecting the sovereignty of God, you're the one that's actually trying to defeat the sovereignty of God because you're saying that we can't have any part in it. Well, therefore, you're saying, God, you can do anything you want. Oh, except for one rule we have, God. Us Calvinists have one rule. You cannot create a man who truly has the ability to choose for himself. You can't do that, God. We forbid that. You see how, re how absurd that is? Of course, God can do all of this. But it says in the Bible so many places that whosoever will will believe and they're saved. Okay, whosoever will. It doesn't say whosoever God says will get to heaven will, will get to heaven. All the others that uh, they never had a chance because he said they can't come to heaven before they were even born. He said that? No. He loves us all. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever, not among the elect, whosoever means whosoever. Whosoever. Whosoever existed, who they are, doesn't matter where they came from, doesn't matter how many we're talking about, whosoever means anyone who will believe will be saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. When these people started speaking evil of Paul, Paul said, well, look, there's been others that have been saved now and want to follow Yeshua HaMashiach. And so I will take them, and I will take them over here to this school, and I will teach them the ways of the Lord from the Tanakh, from the Torah. I'll teach them the prophets that speak about the Messiah and why we believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and the Lord. And so he did this daily in the school of Tyrannus, uh, Tyrannus, not, not Tyrannosaurus Rex, okay, Tyrannus. He did this daily. And look at what verse 10 says, and this is what I really want to focus on today. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now keep in mind that Asia that's talked about here is not the Asia that we know today, China and Japan and all like that. Asia at that time was Asia Minor and it was the area around Ephesus which was part of Turkey, part of Greece, Macedonia, all these areas and everything like that. And that region that was called Asia, Asia Minor in those days. But look at this. Paul continued teaching for two years. He could have stayed there in the synagogue. He could have stayed there and argued with them every day, but he took the believers and said, okay, I've given you the gospel. I've given you the gospel week after week for three months. Some believe, some don't. I'm not going to try to tell you anymore. I'm just going to take the believers because now it's time for them to grow. It's one thing to be born again into the kingdom of God. But just like when you're born into this life, you don't come out of the womb speaking perfect Hebrew or perfect English. You learn that after a while. You don't come out on that operating table there from being delivered as a newborn baby, jumping around and walking and running. You learn how to do that. You don't know any knowledge at that time, but your mind is given the ability to learn knowledge over time, over years, years. And some of us don't learn it really quickly, as, as quickly as others. But basically what I'm saying is just like that happens in your physical birth when you're born into this life, when you're reborn by believing on Jesus as the Messiah and Lord, it takes a while to grow. And so Paul's saying, okay, well, come over here. Every day I'm going to be teaching you the things about God so that you can grow in your new life, you see. And it says this was so successful that he continued this for two full years. And all 
that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. What, was Paul going around talking to everybody? No. He would teach them, and one of the things you teach the new believers is because God loved you, you're saved, and you've seen how He loves you and what He's done for you. Now you go and tell somebody else so that they can be saved. So these disciples Paul was teaching was now going out and telling other people, and they were becoming believers, and then they were being discipled, and they would go out and tell others, and over and over again, until all who dwelt in Asia at the very least heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And that's where it ended in verse 10. Now, we go into verse 11 as we finish up this part of our chapter today. It says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, and so that even handkerchiefs or aprons, cloth if you will, were brought from Paul's body. He was using them for clothing or maybe to wipe his hands or over his shoulder or something. Had need of them and handkerchiefs, you know, just to kind of maybe wipe the sweat off his head sometime. It gets hot in the Middle East. And it says, God was doing unusual miracles by the hand of Paul, verse 12, so that even the handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and diseases left the sick and evil spirits went out from them. They left them because God was doing unusual miracles. And then it says, you know, we'll get into this verse 13 in just a little bit. I want you to pay attention in verse 11, that word unusual miracles. Hmm. And you say, well, wait a minute, Stephen. A miracle is something that is impossible for man to do. A miracle is something that just doesn't happen in normal life, so they're really all unusual. Yes, but they had seen miracles of healing the sick. They had seen miracles of even raising the dead. But then some of the people thought, well, I saw Jesus do this one time, and he reached down, and he touched that person. I remember when he healed that man of blindness. He made some mud, he spit in it, and made some mud, and put that on his eyes, and now the man could see. And so let's just do it exactly like he did. No, it says here, God was doing something new. He worked unusual, not the usual miracles. That's what unusual means. He didn't use the usual miracles, <laughs> uh, mighty things that have no other explanation other than that by the hand of God. He did unusual miracles. Paul didn't even have to go over there and touch somebody. They said, Paul, can I use that piece of cloth you have in your pocket? Oh, sure, go ahead. What are you going to do with it? I'm just going to take it over here and, and just... Uh, Wipe the sweat off this person's head. They haven't been able to walk for all these years, but I'm going to take it over there. They touch the forehead, and the person just all of a sudden is healed and can walk. He hadn't walked all of his life. He was born without the ability to use his legs, and now he could walk. And all of these sick, the diseases left them. People who were possessed by demons, evil spirits, the evil spirits left them just by touching this cloth that Paul used to have with him. That's an unusual miracle. It just goes to show you, my brother and sister, God will do things in ways that you can't imagine. You tend to think of the miracles that you would like Him to do in your life, and you tend to do the things and ask for the things that are humanly possible. Why don't you just tell God what your needs are, and you let Him take care of the how He's going to do that answer for that prayer because he'll do things in unusual ways too. Don't put God in a box. He'll break out of any box you try to put him in, no matter how little, no matter how big it is. He is greater than your understanding. His thoughts are higher than your ways as the heavens are above the earth, the book of Isaiah says in the Tanakh. It says then in verse 13, it says, then some of the itinerant and uh, itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. And they were saying to these people, we exorcise you demons by, by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And also these were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did this thing, who did these things, who did so. But now look at this. They were itinerant it says. What does itinerant mean? It means someone who travels from one place to another, usually, or it can be, on a circuit, certain places that they go through all the time. 
Now, I don't know, maybe they were asking for money when they went to try to do these things. Maybe they convinced people that they had power over the demons and everything like that. But whatever it was, they would go to these different places and they would, the same towns that they had been to before, they would go to these places again and keep doing whatever it is they were telling the people they were doing. They were probably making a living from that or trying to make a living from that. But when they saw Paul doing these miracles and demons being cast out in the name of Jesus, they said, well, this is something new. We hadn't heard about that. So he's doing this in the name of the Lord Jesus. So let's try that. We don't believe in the Lord Jesus, of course, but let's try that. We'll use. And so they tried to just name the name of the Lord Jesus over these evil spirits and people who are possessed by demons. And it says, we exercise you by, the, by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And it said and there were seven sons of Sceva who did this, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And it says in verse 15, and the evil spirit would answer back to them and say, well, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt out upon them, overpowered them, seven of them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And verse 17 says, Then this became known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, a big, big city there. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So you see, it's obviously not enough just to know who Jesus is. It's obviously not enough just pretending to be religious and using the name of Jesus. Look at what that evil spirit said to these seven sons of Sceva. He says, well, Jesus I know. Of course I know him. He's the son of God. Of course I know him. Paul I know because he's in the Lamb's book of life, and God knows him because he's saved, because he believes on Jesus, the son of God. But then this evil spirit says, but who are you guys? You're not believers in Jesus and God's not protecting you. So he jumped on them, beat them all severely to where they were naked and wounded and ran out of the house. And what happened there? Became known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in this big city of Ephesus and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. I mean, think about it. They're saying like, not only can this name heal the sick, not only can this name raise the dead, this name can even have power over demons and cast out demons. And the demons even say that they know the ones who believe on Jesus and they fear them. They fear the Son of God, you see. But these other people who just use the name, try to appear to be religious, try to be fake believers because they want the power so that they can make money by casting demons out of these demon-possessed people. Those people were not true believers, and so the demon jumped on them and beat them. God would not protect them because they weren't His children. You can be His child by believing on His Son, but these people were not His child children. And then verse 18 says, And many who believed came confessing, telling their deeds. The whole city was, they, they go, what is going on here? We've never ever seen anything like this. We've seen a lot of interesting things in our lives, but look, this name of Jesus and those who believe on Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lord, those who believe on Him are given such amazing power by God to do these things. And so they came and they confessed their sins and they would tell their deeds. In other words, their sins. And it says in verse 19, also many who had practiced magic, which was against the Tanakh. It was against the law in the Torah. God had said that those who practice such things will be sent to hell. And so you did not want to try to be a believer and, and try to do magic. It said those who practice magic just felt in their hearts this was evil and they shouldn't be doing this because Jesus is real. The power of God is real and we're seeing these unusual even miracles that God is doing. So they brought their books about magic together 
And they got together and said, we don't need these things anymore. We want the power of God Almighty, the true and living God in our lives. We want the love of God. We want the forgiveness of God Almighty, the creator of thing, all things in our lives. They would take their magic books and all the things they used to try to trust and try to make tricks from and everything and try to invoke demons to do these things. They took and they brought them all together and they burned them in the sight of everybody. They're saying like, we don't believe in that stuff anymore because we're children of God now. And it says in verse 20, or right before it, it says, and they counted up the value of all these books and things about magic in total 50,000 pieces of silver. That was a lot of money. So what it was saying was a lot of the people in Ephesus believed in magic and were doing demonic things because they thought it would give them power. And they were worshiping idols in these places and the Greeks were worshiping idols that people, craftsmen, would carve out of wood and stone. Think about it. They'd go out to the forest, cut down a tree, get some wood, and carve it and make it look like a god, and then tell people it's a god. And everyone buys this piece of wood, which used to be part of a tree in the forest, and they fall down before it and pray to it. That's crazy. The real true God who made all things is not an idol. Idols can't move, walk. Think about that. They would have to carry their idols from one place to the other because apparently idols can't walk. Those gods can't walk. What are you doing worshiping a god like that? You know, yeah, you're, you're saying he's got all power and yet he can't walk. Come on, you have to carry him around. You remember the story of Rachel and and Leah, her sister and everything, when they left with Jacob back in the book of Genesis, and she stole one of her father's household idols, household god. And, and look at what Laban, her father, said. She said, who took my God? Who took my God? They kidnapped my God, is, I guess is what he was saying. And, and, and so, if, you know, he never found out who did it and everything. But what kind of a God can be kidnapped and taken away? What kind of a God is that, you know? And it says they counted up the value of all this junk that the people had that didn't do them any good, that was crazy to try to worship these things and do these things of magic. And it was worth 50,000 pieces of silver. That tells you how many people were into these false ideas there in this pagan city of Ephesus. But verse 20 then says, So the word of the Lord grew mightily, and it prevailed. Because the word of God is not just in word, it's in power. That's what we're seeing. But the thing I want to come back to as we close today is Paul had gone to other towns and other cities in his travel. And this is now one of the last ones that we're seeing him go through. In other towns and other cities, he had been beaten. He had been stoned. People were trying to kill him. They were waiting for him at the city gates so that they could ambush him and kill him. He had to be let down through a hole in the wall in a basket so that he could escape a whole group of people that had taken an oath and they were trying to kill him. What is going on with Paul? That he would go to a new town and say the same words of the same gospel so that others could have everlasting life too. Paul was continuing in his calling. Now I know there's people today, maybe you know some too, that at the first sign of trouble, they're out of there. Oh yeah, they come to a place and they say, well, God called me to here, and so I'm, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to be faithful to the calling that God's given me. But yet the first sign of any trouble at all, Sometimes it's even, well, my friend was with me and, and now he left and I don't want to be here alone without my friend here to help me, so I'm going back home too. They don't know how to continue anymore. Paul comes here. He sees the Lord moving among these people, doing these miracles, saving souls, the greatest miracle to where now those who are going to be in hell are now going to be snatched out of hell and put into the glorious kingdom of heaven and given everlasting life and the love of God forever and ever and unimaginable beauty that they'll be given. Paul has sacrificed his whole life to bring these people that hope, that peace, that everlasting life. And now Paul is simply continuing. He says, look, 
I was going to travel through and go to other places. But you guys need me here. We got some believers here. I'm going to stay here and spend two years teaching you. Here's a place over here, the school of Tyrannus. We'll, we'll, we'll just go in there and every day I'll teach you about the things of the kingdom of God. And he taught them and they taught others and they taught others and many, many, many people in all the region came to the Lord and were saved. What did Paul do? He decided to continue. He said, I'm in a race. It doesn't matter that I ran in the race. What matters is that I finish the race. There's no credit for just running in the race. Oh yeah, I was there until I started, my legs started getting sore, and I was a little thirsty, and I saw a coffee shop over the side, and I said, you know, enough of this race. I'm gonna go over there and sit and watch everyone else run. That's not how it happens. You run the race, you finish the race. You can't finish the race unless you continue in the race. Paul is continuing. Hebrew word, leamshich. Leamshich, continue to continue. What do you need? Lehamshich. I need to continue. You need to continue. Lehamshich. Okay? Lehamshich. You need to continue. Run that race, finish that race, and you will be rewarded. Amen? You're saved by believing, but now go with that message that can give salvation to others and continue in the race to the finish line. Why don't you give your life to the Lord today, completely, right now? If you call out to Him, He'll hear that cry. He'll answer you. He'll rescue you from the darkness that you're in. He'll shine His light on your heart, and you're going to be given a new life. He'll change you, in fact, to a new person and throw away all those past failures, sail away from them. You'll be made completely new, given a new start, and He'll even give you everlasting life in heaven. And that promise is guaranteed by God Himself. Now we want to give you an opportunity to believe right now. To believe in Jesus as the Messiah and Lord. And to receive God's peace in your life, this peace that we're talking about. Peace that the world can never take away. Peace that passes all understanding. You can be saved and given everlasting life in heaven by simply believing that God sent His one and only Son into the world to save us from judgment. Just pray something like this. You could repeat it after me if you like. The important thing is that you mean it from your own heart. You can use some of these words, but mean it as you're speaking to God. Just say, God, I do want to know you. I do want to have real peace in life, Lord. I believe on your son, Jesus Christ, as Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach. Please forgive all my sins. I give my life to you, Lord, and I thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I'll tell you, God heard you. And even now, you may not realize it, He's already started working in your life. A little seed's been planted deep down in your heart, and over time, you're going to begin to see the changes that God's making in your heart, in your life. You get in a good Bible-based church, learn about Him every day in His Word, you talk to Him every day in prayer, I'll tell you, He's going to do beautiful things in your life.
when darkness 